Hello everyone, welcome to the JCPL show. I'm Chantel and this is Steam with Chantel. We're here on location at Asbury University with Dr. Ben Bramel. Hi Chantel. Uh, my name is Ben Bramel. I'm a biology professor here at Asbury University. Um, I uh, teach and uh, do research in the field of ecology and uh, environmental science and have been here for uh, 10 years. Okay. When did your interest in studying biology begin? Chantel, I've always had a really uh, keen interest in animals, as far back as I can remember. Um, as a kid, I had collections of salamanders and frogs uh, and um, fish and snakes. Um, when I was in fourth grade, we had a pet um, caiman, which is essentially an alligator, uh, in the room. And one person got to take it home for spring break uh, each year, and I got to take it home, and I was super excited about that. So. As far back as I can remember, I've loved animals and just uh, spent uh, all the time that I could pursuing and, and uh, observing and capturing animals. How long have you taught at Asbury? Chantel, this is my 11th academic year here. So I've been here uh, 10 academic years at uh, Asbury. Um, I taught for a couple of years at di different places after I finished my PhD before uh, ending up here at Asbury. How much time do you spend in the field and in the classroom? Well, Chantel, we do go in the field frequently. I would like to be in the field all the time if that was possible, but of course it's you know not uh, possible. You can't always take lecture classes into the field. But this morning, for instance, in our ecology class, um, we were out in the field uh, collecting invertebrates. Um, we, we do a lot of electrofishing, um, working with aquatic organisms, aside from it being my, what I've always uh, done research with, it's a great way to introduce students uh, to the natural world because there's nothing they can get. They can't get any diseases uh, from these organisms uh, like rabies. If we were working with mammals, for instance, they're very easy to catch very quickly. And we capture somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 species of fish in our local streams, which is astounding. And so it gives us a really good chance to look at these assemblage of organisms uh, in ecosystems that we just couldn't do if we looked at terrestrial organisms. So we spend a good bit of time in the field. Uh, Research-wise, um, it's a split between the field and the lab. And so we go to the field to collect uh, samples. That's really probably the most fun part of research. Um, and then we do maintain or organisms in the lab for various uh, reasons for research. Um, but then we spend a lot of time in the laboratory as well, uh, conducting molecular analysis on those samples that we collected. That brings me to my next question. How do you engage students in your research? Well, that's an interesting question uh, today, Chantel. And so that's the one of the biggest um, topics in, in undergrad higher education is engaging students in research. When I was a student, that was more of an optional uh, feature. Like I, I did a little bit of research, um, but it really wasn't expected. Today, um, it's really expected that undergraduates will have some research experience. So what I try to do, this doesn't always work, but what I try to do is in my lab, have undergrads um, that are interested in what we're working on volunteer first, and so they'll play a supporting role in a project. Um, and they'll learn from the students that are in the lab and learn from me. And then as they get an idea of what's going on, they have the opportunity to take on a project all of their own. Each of our students, like at nearly all universities today in science, will complete a senior research project. Um, and so if what we're doing is interesting to them, they can eventually select a, a larger project that they have primary responsibility for um, and, uh, and be, you know, engage and uh, complete that uh, in the lab. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't, but that's the, the overall goal. Very nice. Tell me a little bit more about your past research. Well, uh, Chantel, originally I was an aquatic toxicologist. Um, and so uh, my PhD is, is in biology, but the research is aquatic toxicology. And so um, that was really interesting research and good research to, to uh, career-wise because it did involve a great deal of lab and field work. I had some experience uh, with fish and knowledge of fish from, from a previous undergraduate and then my master's uh, program. And so in that research, uh, we looked at the responses of fish populations uh, to really high levels of pollution uh, in different parts of uh, Kentucky. And uh, what we saw was something that's been observed in other parts of the world, that some of these organisms had uh, evolved tolerance uh, to that contamination. Um, we do have, although we're fortunate to live in a state that's relatively clean compared to, to other states in the U.S. overall, we do have some pockets that are very, very contaminated. Um, and so interestingly, fish in, in these areas, uh, at least some species, uh, have developed the ability to persist in spite of that contamination. Very interesting. Continue and tell me more about your current research. Well, 
my current research um, is it still involves a blend of field work and lab work. Um, but uh, in about 2012 or so, someone came up with this idea that you could use DNA to identify the organisms that are present in the environment. And so the, the basic idea is this, that all animals that live in the environment are excreting DNA. Now, this has been used for terrestrial organisms too, but it's more applicable to aquatic organisms because they're in direct contact with the water and the DNA they release diffuses uh, throughout the system in which they live. So each organism, this is one of the most interesting things in biology, each organism has a unique sequence of, of a unique DNA sequence. And so it is the basis of DNA, the A, C, T, and G. It's the order of those bases that determine the organism. Um, and so humans, for instance, have uh, 3.2 billion or so of those bases. Many salamanders that we work with have a much bigger uh, genome than that. And so the sequence, even among different individuals within a species, is unique. But certainly from one species to, a net, to the next, there are unique sequences of uh, bases. And so you can use that sequence of bases to determine which species uh, the DNA belongs to. This means that, that this so-called environmental DNA is useful because let's say that we want to find a very rare organism. That's the most common application of environmental DNA, although there are many others. A, a good example would be a hellbender. And so hellbenders are these really crazy salamanders um, that get to be uh, two feet in length. So we have many salamanders in the state, most of them, um, are uh, quite small. Would this be a good time to show you a salamander? Mm -hmm. So um, we have a number of salamander species uh, in the state. There's about 20 or so that we collect here in central Kentucky. So this is a, a spotted salamander, um, which is a, a, a beautiful uh, little salamander. They're not, I wouldn't call them uncommon in central Kentucky, but they're, you know, they're not something you see every day. They're burrowing salamanders. And so this is, uh, you know, this, this is a little bit on the big end of a, a salamander that we would commonly see. Uh, but hellbenders, on the other hand, are the only member of the giant salamander family that we have in Kentucky. And they get to be two feet long, but they're very, very difficult to locate. And so hellbenders live um, at the bottom of streams, the bottom of the Kentucky River, uh, underneath really huge boulders. And... Um, and so if you want to go look for one, like there was a, a researcher recently who was searching for hellbenders in Kentucky, and he found them at very, very few sites um, at which he uh, visited. So a very good way to look for them is environmental DNA. The hellbenders are releasing DNA, so you can go to the stream, take a water sample, filter the DNA from the water, and then you look at the sequences of DNA in that filtered uh, sample. And you'll have DNA from hundreds of different sources. But the molecular techniques that are available today allow us to, to pick out the DNA from that one species that we're interested in. So that's the basic idea. And, and we employ, there, there's a lot of demand for it. It's a very recent uh, technique. So we employ uh, environmental DNA to look for things like salamanders. Uh, we've looked for endangered species of frogs um, that are found in, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, we, we do a lot of um, work with fish, environmental DNA, looking for certain species of fish. I'm glad you touched on environmental DNA. That was my next question. That's Explain awesome. eDNA. Yeah. What are its applications and how it's useful? Yeah, that's the that's the basic idea. So we have it's been pretty firmly established. What I just described to you has been pretty firmly established. Like we, we know that we can use environmental DNA to detect rare species of organisms. Kind of the next step is going to be using environmental DNA to identify assemblages of organisms. And it involves a, a different type of sequencing uh, that's available today, one type of next generation sequencing. And so it allows you to take all the DNA at once that's in a sample and obtain sequences from that. And it requires computers to sort through to, to classify these different organisms uh, using bioinformatics. Um, and so that's, you know, the goal will be eventually that it changes ecology you know, dramatically. And so, for instance, we go out and we electrofish uh, to assess pop populations of fish, which is for 50 years, I, I would guess, or more, has been the standard uh, to assess fish populations. But if environmental DNA can be tweaked in such a manner that we can get a good idea of what species are present and how many are present, then it really opens up a world of possibilities because it's so much faster and so much cheaper. Um, and it doesn't harm the fish in any way, so it really allow you to do things that we not other you would not otherwise be able to do. Tell me some things you would like the community to know about biology diversity. Chantel, one of my favorite things to, to talk about and, and something I, I feel like people miss out on a lot of times um, 
and it would enrich their lives is, is the diversity of animals that we have here in Kentucky. Um, so we're part, just barely, but part of the southeast, and the southeastern United States is really rich um, in terms of, of diversity. Now, of course, we don't stack up with South and Central America, but as far as the Northern Hemisphere goes, we're not doing too bad at all. And so we have this huge number of species uh, around us. And I don't know, but it seems like many people are unaware of, of many of these. And so we looked at the salamander earlier. You know, it's so easy to miss out on salamanders. The spotted salamander I showed you, they'll move across the road in the hundreds uh, in the spring. And I, I know a large percentage of people just drive along um, you know, probably smashing them as they go and just unaware. And I was guilty of that myself at, at one particular point in time. Um, we have 33 snake species in, this, in the state. Um, something that uh, always pains me a little bit is when people, uh, you know, kill snakes and cringe when they, they uh, think about snakes. This, this is one of my favorite uh, snakes that I have here in the department. And one of the, our, I wouldn't definitely call it rare, but it's uh, one of our really beautiful uh, snake species in the state. It's a king snake, an eastern uh, king snake. We have two patterns that are found in the snake, in the state, excuse me. Um, and the snakes, you know, are just all around us and, and certainly something we can, we can look at uh, and uh, appreciate. Black rat snakes are the most common uh, large snake that we have here in central Kentucky. Um, and then garter snakes, of course, are, are everywhere as well. Um, we also have over 100 mussel species that are found uh, in, in the state. And he's a pretty strong little guy. And so, um, mussel species are definitely something that's easy to, uh, to miss out on. Um, and so, this is a washboard uh, mussel from the Kentucky River. These things are unbelievably common in the river uh, close to here. And so, when we, for instance, uh, put nets uh, into the river and pull up those nets, the goal of the, the nets are to catch fish. But there's so many of these at the bottom that we always end up with a pile of these that come from the bottom of the river. Now, I should point out, these are old shells. These guys have a long, long time, and they died so a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. But the shells are at the bottom of the river. Of course, we never collect lots live uh, mussel species, um, but we have this great uh, diversity of animals around us in the state. We have 200, for instance, and 40-something uh, fish species that, that are found in Kentucky, which is amazing. When you go to the western states, you just have a handful of uh, species, um, but we have this huge diversity of species um, that's found in the, that are found in the waters and the, the woods of the state. Lastly, tell me some environmental issues here in Kentucky. Well, Chantel, um, we're fortunate, as I mentioned before, that we don't suffer from the acute toxicity issues that other places like, you know, really highly populated, populated states like New York does. But we have, you know, we share some of the environmental issues that many other states um, do. We have uh, our share of introduced uh, species. Um, and so as you look around the state, you know, that, that's another thing that is not always immediately evident to people, but a large number of the animals you see around you are not supposed to be here, but they're uh, what we refer to as introduced exotic uh, species. And so our goal in science today is to maintain things in, in the natural state. And so by that, we mean the original state. And, and um, so as we look at animals and manage animals, we try to keep the native animals, the ones that were here originally, in place and protect them and get rid of the exotic animals. Oftentimes, the exotic animals have harmful effects on the native animals. And so some examples of introduced exotic species, um, especially, I guess I'll start with ones in the aquatic world. This, this is Corbicula, the Asian uh, clam. And so this is not one that has a very profound impact on lots of other species, but it's everywhere in the state, absolutely everywhere. We just came from Jessamine Creek a couple miles from here, and uh, a couple um, of uh, semesters ago, students were doing their lab exercise, and they found 800 in a one meter uh, little quadrat. So they're just tremendous numbers of these guys, and they're found everywhere throughout uh, Kentucky and most of the rest of the United States. We now have zebra mussels in the state, so zebra mussels are a huge issue uh, throughout the United States. When I went to school here at Asbury years ago, there were no zebra mussels uh, down in the Kentucky River. Now, I'd go there and fish, and you'd never find a zebra mussel, but they since then they made their way here. They're spreading out across the United States. Zebra mussels attached to our native mussels, preventing them from opening and, and killing them. Um, and in fact, they're very competitive with our native mussels. Uh, they filter some of the same food as our native mussels and, and have impacts on, on our uh, native uh, species. You know, one that's talked about a tremendous amount right now are Asian carp. Um, so we've had European carp for years and years and years uh, in the state for 
a hundred years, uh, most likely. And they are absolutely uh, everywhere and get, get quite large. And we've kind of come to terms with those and accepted those. But the Asian carp uh, have just moved in in the past decade. And so there's a tremendous amount of talk today about getting rid of those. And I was looking at nets yesterday and their special nets advertised for Asian carp. Um, and there's all kinds of, there's a business, if I'm not mistaken, in Western Kentucky that, that's trying to market those. And, and we're trying to come up with ways to, to deal with those uh, species. Um, so, and then we, of course, we have our traditional uh, problems in the terrestrial uh, realm, kudzu uh, and uh, bush honeysuckle uh, being good examples of invasive exotic uh, plants um, that are present. We have lots of invasive birds as well, starlings, for instance, English sparrows. Um, so invasive exotic species are certainly an issue in our state, uh, as they are throughout, well, much of the rest of the world uh, today. Another issue that we have in Kentucky that's fairly unique to, to um, at least it hit the southeast particularly hard, are we have dams. And so when people uh, talk about Kentucky, we also often think about the lakes that we have in the state. So in fact, we only have one lake uh, present in Kentucky. And we barely have that, real foot. Uh, real foot was formed by an earthquake and we share it with Tennessee. Um, but the, the bodies of water we think of as lakes, Cumberland, uh, Barkley, Kentucky, uh, Laurel and so forth, Harrington, close to here, are all actually reservoirs. Um, and they actually had a very profound impact uh, on the environment and the aquatic organisms that, that are present here. No more so than mussels. Um, so if we look at our uh, mussel species that we have in the state, we have 100, but 20 are gone out of the state, largely as a result uh, of those uh, dams. If you look across the, the entire southeast, where the really heart of mussel diversity and the rest of aquatic diversity in the United States is found, um, there are no species, no group of species, uh, of which there are a greater number on the endangered species list than mussels as a result of those dams. So when you build a dam, you disrupt the stream for several hundred miles, uh, most likely. Some of those western lakes, for instance, um, Barkley and Kentucky, you build a dam and they stretch for over 100 miles uh, upstream of that dam. And the stream below, the river below the dam, like for instance at Cumberland, is disrupted as well. Um, oftentimes, like at Cumberland, they're a hypolimnionic discharge, which means they release water from the bottom of the lake and it's extremely cold. Even the hottest days of the year, like, like right now, the water's in the 50s that emerges uh, from that uh, dam. And so that's good for trout and we put trout in there, but there are no trout species that are native to the state. So the species that are supposed to be there in just the Cumberland, for instance, in those hundreds of probably 100 plus miles at least of the Cumberland River, uh, many of those are, are completely gone or suffering greatly as a result of loss of habitat uh, because of those uh, dams. So there are advantages to dams, of course, flood control and recreation, um, but it's, I think a lot of times we don't think about the cost uh, of those dams, and there is a steep environmental cost that we paid in the construction of those. Thank you very much, and thank you all for tuning in to Steam with Chantel.